Good coffee morning, friends. So, I was called recently on uh, abusing terminology, I suppose, because my perceptions of these things are a bit different, and the importance of separating those things, to my mind, is important. So... That's the challenge in eight minute videos and lazy presentation is discussing the whys to some of the things that I've mentioned, commented about, given my perspective on. So that makes it challenging to present when you're trying to be honest and not deceive yet lay out clear distinctions in measurements, sciences, and a zero, a relative and an absolute zero. Try doing that in eight minutes, which is about the average length of my videos. These are meant to challenge you to go figure more out. So what sparked this was beta particles and their interaction with reality. And a beta particle is called, in some circles, very well and reasoned out, a negative electron. So, it has a relationship to electrons. But the difference is, we really don't know of any way to harness that energy from a beta emission. We can't create a potential to drive beta particles very easily. We can with some very sophisticated physics, but in your day-to-day -day life, the electron is running through wires in your wall and powers your charger. That's day to day, the electron. We know very well what that energy is, how it works, how to use it. It's related to chemistry. Electrons define the pH of a substance. A lack of electrons or an abundance of electrons. So the pH scale is actually a scale of what would it be called? Electron potential? But that's not how you would speak to it as a biologist, as a general research scientist, maybe. So these words, the nuances in these words, the terminology and the audience that's listening matters. So I draw a distinction between a beta particle and an electron. I don't know how you use a beta, I, I know how a beta particle affects an electron when it runs into it. The stochastic odds of that, the, the game theory odds of that incident happening. But that beta particle is still a discrete, unique particle compared to an electron. And it's all frigging amazing. So, one of the ways we identify these things is spectrometry, right? A very specific field of spectrometry called scintillation detectors. That is a specific detector type. You have a crystal, crystal of ultra high purity material that is doped with other very ultra high purity materials. And by doped, it's one part per million. And that crystal will fluoresce when certain energies go by it. It's the only thing that makes it fluoresce is those energies going by. The fluorescence is a photon of light from the crystals itself, right? Where th there's a frequency in there. That crystal did not respond to an electron. It doesn't know what an electron is its characteristics well-defined through the sciences of metrology, the measurement sciences, 
knows exactly what that crystal will see, right? Visually, that crystal is connected up typically in the old days to a photomultiplier tube. That photomultiplier tube might be driven with a thousand volt potential in order to get electrons at the edge of movement so that that photon of light from the crystal below it going up through the wires in that vacuum tube will displace electrons on cathodes and anodes and make them cascade into a readable signal. So there's a piece of detector physics inside spectrometers specifically applied to high energy particle measurement. But that's not actually how we measure these things. How we measure them is different sciences because we're looking for isotopes. Isotopes, if they are not in a decay state, can't be detected with a scintillation detector because they're not emitting any of those energies. The alphas, the betas, the gammas, the ancillary damage to anything nearby because that's how it works. Meanwhile, the electrons are flowing in the wall to your power outlet. The incidental sidestepping the frequency conversations, right? Whether it's 60 hertz in the wall or gigahertz on those antennas, on the antenna in your pocket inside your cell phone, are all effects of matter we could speak to. So eight minute videos don't work for this. I, because of a little bit of background, simply look at these things differently than a lot of people do. So, there's another explanatory video. We'll get on to uh, something else. Or not. Anyway, peace out, neighbors. Still voting Bernie. On the good side, if Bernie does drop out, I hope he creates a third party. There you go, some politics for the day. Because both of these Yahoo things need to be challenged. And I'm not sure the Democratic Party is willing to accept those challenges internally. It's apparent that they don't. They reject them, kind of. But, hey, AOC, let's see where it goes. On the good side... If Bernie does drop out of the presidential campaign, he's not going to drop out of life. I can unregister as a Democrat and go back to an independent. Make them pander for our votes. This is why they don't want them counted. Neither party. <laughs> Peace out. Love. Avoid the virus. Stay healthy. Care for the neighbors.